Good evening. It would help if I put my face on camera. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Shelby on Safari live stream, the channel where I, Shelby, a wild animal biologist and pop culture lover, lover of history and all things, discuss with you the wonders of the animal world and relate it to cool things that may be happening in the world around you, or I guess in particular, what's happening with me. Good evening, Jason. Lovely to see you. I'm so excited for you to be joining me this evening. And if you're watching in the replay, like I know many of you do, like my friend Jody, be sure to drop me a comment as well. So tonight we are going to be glowing, glowing, going, globe trotting. That's right, friends. We're talking about packing and traveling. And so I'm going to introduce you to some animals that travel incredible distances, some animals that are quite good at packing before discussing five interesting top five uh, countdown things, if you will. So I'm gonna share with you my top five things that I will bring with me on the flight and my top five things that I will bring with me from the UK when I go abroad as bestowing gifts to the fine people of whichever country I am visiting. And I'm uh, very excited for you guys to join me tonight. And if you are wanting to take part in the chat, you know, we always have like little pop culture quizzes along the way uh, with regards to kind of animals, but I'm willing in the chat, if you wanna post what you think the top five things that I will bring with me on my flight, as well as the top five things that you think I will bring from this fine United Kingdom across a particular pond. Oh, and speaking of traveling, we have the guru herself, Tiffany from A Girl and Her Tra Passport. Um, Tiff gets up to all sorts of incredible adventures. I know she too is going someplace epic this Easter because I follow her on Instagram. Uh, so yeah, super excited. And I know TDLR filmmaker, my buddy Jason, he is all tech guru-ness. And I'm excited, Jason, because my father uh, apparently has, <laughs> get this, some spare GoPros. And so Shelby on Safari might be taking the next step forward using some epic GoPro footage. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm going to need your help <laughs> helping me out with that, Jason. And uh, yeah, thanks so much to Alice for giving me the idea for tonight's live stream. Thanks, matey. All right. So, folks, we're going to get right on in because, as you may have imagined, um, this is about packing. And I said, this is something that I should be working on doing. Um, and I tried to create this live stream in the hopes that I would pack, but I haven't. <laughs> Instead, I've been preparing for the live stream and be doing everything else but packing. I don't mind not packing. And I'd be curious to hear from you guys and especially Tiffany, because you travel a lot. Um, like I'm not that particularly fussed about packing too far in advance. Um, I think it stems from the fact that one year when I was packing to go actually visit Europe when I was back home in California, I left my suitcase out and I had it packed and I was pretty chuffed with like the packing requirements. Um, but my cat peed on my suitcase. <laughs> and I think ever since then, I don't quite think I've had the same, uh, you know, idea to pack so far in advance. And I, chances are, I'm telling you this, guys, now, I'm going to be packing the night before. Um, and no fault of anybody's. Uh, I even told my husband, because he was offering to go up in the loft to get my suitcase to do my kind of summer to winter wardrobe change, because I'm going to need shorts where I'm going. And I was like, no, no, it's okay. You can wait. You can wait. Alice likes to pack. <laughs> Four years. Alice likes to pack four years before. That is intense, Alice. Oh my gosh. And yes, Tiffany's freaking out. I do leave it a few days. Um, God willing, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything crossed. Uh, my test on Thursday goes smooth sailing. I've been hiding myself in a bubble um, and I should be flying out on Friday. So, so excited. And yeah, Jason, I am going to have fun. And Pringle Pupa. Hello. Good evening. Hey, howdy. Hey, hey, howdy. Hey, hey, that reminds me of my friend uh, Woody from Toy Story. I like that kind of introduction. Hey, howdy. Hey. All right, friends, I'm getting distracted already. We've covered so many different things, but not what we need to get through. Uh, oh, I do want to shout that I actually I, I, I know I have this up. This slide is irrelevant to what we've been talking about. But I have gosh, this is intense started a TikTok. Um, yeah. I don't know how long it will last, but I've tried it because I have a lot of animal content. And one of my friends, Grace, Honest Bee by G, now Cruelty Free by G, said, use your animal stuff and share some stuff on TikTok because there's a lot of uh, sketchy stuff on TikTok. I'm not going to lie. 
Uh, and I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. So I tried it. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Let's say that. All right. So guys, first, uh, we're going to talk about some animals that travel incredible distances that you may not have heard of. Now, many of you may have heard of the Arctic train because I have quite the reputation for being the quite majestic uh, migrators, if you will. And the Arctic terns can travel up to 59,000 miles per year. Talk about some frequent flyer miles. You'd rack up a free flight quick if you were an Arctic tern. Uh, apart from being ridiculously crazy well-traveled, which we'll get to in a bit, I do want to say, first off, how noisy they are and that they have quite the reputation for coming at you like this with their sharp bills coming right at you from a dive bomb attack if you get too close to their young. So very protective parents, very noisy, but I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't want to see this flying at me. Um, I wouldn't want to risk it, but I don't know, props to them, props to them for not only the miles that they fly, but you know, having the guts to stand up and defend their young. Um, quite, quite the sight, quite the sight. Now, they are quite beautiful birds, you know, with the cool little bat cat thing on their head. Um, but sometimes, even though they're great at flying, there's a time in a bird's life, this sounds like really deep, there comes a time in every bird's life, guys, when they molt. Um, and specifically, when, when molting their wing feathers during the winter, the Arctic tern will rarely fly. And I can imagine that'd be a pretty tough time as a bird who flies, what, over 50,000 miles a year to then be stuck, not able to fly. They then have to spend their time kind of bobbing along um, on the packs of sea ice and kind of just resting because they're not able to fly because their wing feathers are molting. And so I don't know, it just seems quite crazy for an animal that flies so many, you know, flies so far that there's a period when they're grounded, quite literally. Um, I wonder how they handle that. Like, I, I don't think I'd take that very well. Um, but I do want to say, given the fact of just how far they fly, I know 50,000 miles, that sounds pretty intense, and it is. But the craziest thing about the Arctic turn, guys, is that it lives for quite a long time, long enough where during the course of their lifespan, these cute little birdies, they fly the distance equivalent to going to the moon and back, not one time, not two times going to the moon and back and moon and back, but three times to the moon and back, moon and back, moon and back. Three times that distance over the course of its lifespan, this little bird can fly, which I, 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 nature is amazing, right? <laughs> the Arctic turn, to say the least, is up there in terms of crazy frequent flyers. Now comes question time. Ah, I jumped ahead to elephant seal. Here we go, guys. Chat, get ready. Even if you're watching replay, you know what to do. Arctic turns, knowing how far Arctic turns in the course of their lifetime can fly to the moon and back three times, that equivalent distance, not actually fly to the moon and back, although that'd be pretty cool. Um, how old do you think they can live up to? Do you think A, they can live up to 11 years, B, live up to 18 years, or C, live up to 29 years? Time for some quick math. Not that, like, yeah. Hopefully you guys can do some quick math. I've tried to hint to how, how old they can live. Um, now, I will say that the figure on this, I found conflicting reports where there was one particular oddball individual that was well above this figure stated um, because of bird ringing, ow, that was my wrist. Um, and they tracked, they were able to track a bird from the little rings that are attached to its legs. And yes, even wild birds, you may notice, uh, especially if you live here in the UK, I never really realized how big bird ringing was until I came here to the UK and I actually got to help with some of it, which was really cool. But it's a great way for us to monitor and track kind of wild birds. And yeah, one of one of the species of Arctic turd lived up to well in its mid thirties. Crazy. So yes, Tiffany, you are correct, my dear, with 29 C, couple of C, C dogs, C for the Arctic, uh, and because it's a seabird, sea dogs, yeah. Yeah. 
I need like a drum roll <laughs> sound effect. Uh, but yes, math, Alice, math. It's not a plural maths, maths. Yeah, that feels weird. Cause it's like math, you do math, maths, math, math. You do mathematical equations. Yes, anyways. Shall we carry on? All right, so that was the Arctic Tern, guys. And one of the other cool animals that I wanted to shout out about being able to travel crazy distances that you might not think of as one that travels very far, but actually is a fellow Californian, the Northern Elephant Seal. Now, when I say Californian, I say it loosely, um, as you'll see why. So they can travel up to 13,000 miles per year. That is pretty impressive. But the Northern Elephant Seal has a couple other cool things apart from the fact that they travel a lot. Uh, first one that I wanna shout out is conservation message uh, time with Shelby is that they were actually once thought to be extinct because of commercial sealing in the 1800s. So this picture doesn't quite do their size justice, but they are rather moosive animals. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, <laughs> people just went crazy saying, oh, we need blubber, we need this, we need that, uh, let's kill all the elephant seals. And so really sad to find that uh, they were thought to be extinct, but I'm pleased to say that they aren't. Um, they're actually really good divers as well. Uh, and we'll show a picture of them on the beach. So yeah, you still can't see just how big they are, but they're really big. Um, but given their size, they're excellent divers. And they can dive to depths of about 1,000 to just over 2,000 feet for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then they have to come up, take a short breath at the surface, and then go back down. But uh, that's a crazy amount of time to hold one's breath. Like, they're pretty impressive for their size and the depth that they can go. That is pretty cool. And in the chat, yes, Kahuna. Well done, Alice. Well done. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany says her prize is that I bring her back Peter Pan peanut butter. Yeah, I mean, Peter Pan, Peter Pan is a really good brand. I love Jiffy. I love Jif. I'm not going to be biased, but yeah, Peter Pan is really good. I'll give you a problem. Are you crunchy peanut butter or plain, smooth peanut butter, Tiffany? And for those of you who are wondering what, Tiffany is American as well. She hails from the fine state of Texas. And yes, uh, many of us who have moved abroad, there are certain things in life that we hold dear from um, our home country that we can't quite get in the places over here in Europe. And peanut butter, specifically the Peter Pan brand is one of them. Creamy, interesting, interesting choice. Yeah, crunchy please. Yeah, see, I feel I feel depends on how you take it, guys. I feel like on like toast, I feel like you could go either crunchy or smooth, but I think in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, jam, I would say smooth. Although I would not, I'm, desperate times call for desperate measures, right, Tiff? Like I would happy, happily take anything. Um, I don't know how the Northern Elephant Seal though would take peanut butter because they eat other stuff. <laughs> but like Peter Pad, you know, can do some pretty cool maneuvers. These guys can too under the water. Uh, look at me trying to bring it back into the Northern Elephant Seal. That was really pulling out some strings. Uh, but uh, speaking of like Peter Pad and flying away to Neverland, like I bet that's quite the distance to fly, like props to Peter, man. But the Northern Elephant Seal actually has the record for the mammal that migrates the furthest. So just over kind of 13,000 miles, that's pretty impressive for a mammal to commute. We saw the Arctic turn as a bird really smash that record to be fair, but the Northern elephant seal does what it has to. But on top of migrating, the craziest thing and why I said they're kind of Californians, but kind of not really, is because they spend about 90% of their lives exploring the open waters. Like how cool is that? They're proper, proper sea dogs to say the least. They're always out on the water. And in fact, in a given year, the Northern elephant seal will spend between 250 to 300 days of the year traveling from one place to another. So, you know, they're always on the move. They're always on the move, not really putting down roots, going here, there, and everywhere, all across the sea, but they don't really spend that much time on land and, yeah, not in one place for too long. However, during mating season, things change, and they're on land. And, uh, yeah, on land, time for a quick question. 
whilst on land, my friends. Oh, look at the way I see you. Oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. Look at his little ugly face. Oh, they're so ugly. They're so cute. Um, all right. During the mating season, guys, northern elephant seals can lose up to what percentage of their body weight? So you can see in the pictures that they're pretty hefty animals. They got a lot, lot going on for them. I want to know, what do you think? How much of a percentage do you think they will lose of their body weight during the mating season? Yeah, right? The elephant seal is massive. Oh, interesting. Hot take. You love peanut butter, but you don't love peanuts. Interesting. So what do you have at baseball games, Tiffany? Because I, I always like numbing on peanuts when I'm at a baseball game. And a churro. Oh, oh my God. I'm so excited to have a churro from Costco when I go back. <gasps> Costco churros are the best and they're only a dollar. Maybe inflation has raised the cost of churro prices. I don't know, but either way, it's worth every penny. Oh, some very interesting variety of uh, messages. Oh, hi, Lucky Owl. I did see you earlier, but I forgot to say hi. Hi. Uh, B, 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 C. Interesting. It's actually A amigos is actually a 36% of their body weight can be lost during the mating season, which is yeah, pretty high percentage, I would say. Um, and then yeah, they got to go out and forage and bulk back up again for their hardcore travels. And yeah, I don't know, just the northern elephant seal is quite a cool creature to see. And uh, shout out to my dad when I was younger. Um, this is like story time with Shelby by the time. In fact, I should probably put a picture of the northern elephant seal up so you can kind of get a better idea of just how massive they are. There we go. So in California, these guys are kind of more central to northern California. And when I was younger, we would go up, um, drive along the coast of California to get to a place called Squaw Valley, which is where they train for the Olympics and lots of cool stuff. And so on our way to Squaw Valley, my dad would often stop at a cool couple of places. And this is when I was like quite young. I was like baby Shelly. So like five to like 10, 11 years old. And um, yeah, it became part of our process when we'd go to stop off and see the elephant seals. And it was quite something to hear them. And I remember being quite young and being so in awe of their sheer size, but just the sheer sounds that they emit um, is quite something to see. And so if you are ever fortunate enough to go to kind of that part of the world, I encourage you to try to time it with uh, their breeding season when they're on the beach. Obviously, it's super sketchy because they're fighting. There's lots of uh, high adrenaline when they're on the beach. But it's one of the times to see them because as we know, the northern elephant seal for a good chunk of their life is in the open water moving from place to place. So not really on land all that much. But yeah, such a sight to see. Story time over. All right. Hi, Rita. Nice to see you. <laughs> Sounds like you laughing. Yes, Lucky Al, I did see you. I see everything in the chat. Actually, I don't. a lot of stuff flies by me. And then when I'm re-watching to put the timestamps in, I chuckle because you guys are funny. Y'all make me laugh. Um, but yeah, chat, we're moving on to ants. Now, you know, I usually have that image with like the uh, name and the scientific name up there, but I really want to generally talk ants and I should have given them more time in this, but there's a lot to talk about because next we're going to talk about animals that pack and do some crazy things with packing and carrying stuff with them. But I needed to shout out to ants because if you don't know, ants can, depending on the species, can lift 20 times their own mass. Like they're true weightlifters in the world. And I probably should do like a Durant ant Pokemon comparison video, which might happen in the future. Actually, now that I say it, I'll manifest it into existence. Um, but some species in terms of traveling in the distance that they can go, so little tiny ants, right? They can average about 164 miles in roughly about 40 days on foot. 164 miles in 40 days. That is crazy for a little ant. Like, I guess for us humans, you know, we we could do that. But for an ant, that's insane. Absolutely insane. Um, in fact, in the links in the description down below after <laughs> I chat, I'll pop a link to a really interesting study that was looking at orientation. And so this study kind of moved ants around that were kind of to test their sense of direction per se. And so 
they can still, even though they like they they want to go north, right? So pretend we're ants and we're walking north and we know we have to go north because that's where our queen ant is. They can maintain traveling north even if their body is disorientated and kind of turned a different way. They can still walk and fate like go that direction. They don't need to be like facing it and using kind of the clues, if you will, um, the, the, oh God, what's the word? Temporal clues along the side of them. I'm doing a really bad job of explaining the study and I apologize, uh, but I'll pop in links below because it is really interesting what they did. They tested a lot of different things, but that was one of their main findings, which I thought was quite cool, that they don't need to be kind of facing that direction even though they know they need to go that way, they can kind of just get there. However, <laughs> however they need to get to their queen, they will get to their queen. And speaking of a queen, y'all know I love a good age range. After all, a couple of questions have referred to the age uh, range and lifespans of a few animals. True or false? And isn't this picture nuts? Like, dude, what a cool close up. Uh, Pogo nine, wait, let me try that again. Pogo no Myrex, whoo, say that 10 times fast, uh, can live for up to 30, or actually can live for over 30 years. Do you guys think that's true or false? I mean, it is a tiny ant. Um, and do you think their queens can live for over 30 years? True or false? I mean, that is a long time, but it is a question that I'm asking. So I guess you could think about it that way is... Am I trying to trick you or am I trying to make it easy for you guys? Chat, let me know what you think. True or false? Like, I love looking at pictures like that. Like, how cool to be able to have that macro lens, to be able to get that close to a queen ant. Um, I mean, she doesn't look too well, but she, you know, she looks pretty pretty even though she doesn't look <laughs> very alive. Uh, but yeah, indeed, chat, you are correct? It is true. They can live for over 30 years of age. How crazy is that? And little ant, even though it's the queen ant species, I should say, they can live and have been recorded to live for over 30 years. So anyways, that's ants, guys. It is time now for us to move on before we discuss kind of my top five things to pack and top five things I'm going to bring from the UK to other parts of the world is animals that pack. And what better animal to start off talking about animals that carry things with them and, you know, load stuff around than the adorable sea otter. As you guys might know, I'm a bit biased towards sea otters. I absolutely adore them. And alas, too, they uh, are found in parts of California. So I thought rather fitting to discuss some cool things about the sea otter. Now, in a few other videos, if you frequently join me on Shelly on Safari, which I think quite a few of you do, and if you don't already, be sure to subscribe, hit that like button, all that jazz, and be notified of when I go live and blah, 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 you know the drill. Uh, but I often talk about Pokemon, and one of my favorite Pokemon in the entire world is Oshawott, and every time I can talk about Oshawott, I tried to talk about sea otters as well because they're just adorable. So quick facts about sea otters, in case you don't know, they are the smallest marine mammal of North America, um, especially compared to something like the likes of the Northern elephant seal, right? <laughs> but even though they're the smallest marine mammal, they're still not as small as you think. I bet many of you have seen kind of Asian short clawed otters kind of in captivity. They're the most commonly kept otter species, I would say. Um, I don't know on Zim's record, but I'd be, I'd be willing to bet that they are probably quite common in captivity. But yeah, sea otters are a bit bigger than they are. Now, they're not as big as, say, like the giant otter. Um, but in terms of kind of the other otter species, I know I'm like throwing out otter species like it's no tomorrow, but <laughs> the sea otter is the only true um, aquatic, fully aquatic species of otter. Other otters, you know, they, they dabble in the water. You know, the Eurasian otter, for example, which, by the way, I still have yet to see a Eurasian otter in the wild. And they are taunting me because I've heard they're down the road in Winchester at the city mill. People have seen them at the city mill. Have I? No. Am I upset? Yes. Will my time come of seeing European uh, Eurasian otters in the wild? 
I hope so. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just revel in the fact that I got to uh, be in the same ocean as sea otters. That will keep me going. Um, <laughs> now, you might be thinking, all right, sea otters, how do they pack? What are you talking about, Shelby? Well, they have loose um, kind of skin folds of fur under each forearm that they use to carry snacks for later. Like, how ideal is that? I mean, I bet they probably wouldn't like taste good. Like I wouldn't, I, you can't imagine that, right? Cause you think underneath your arms and like stinky smells, if even if you're wearing deodorant, like I don't know how, how appetizing that is, but apparently for the sea otters, it works. Um, and they also can kind of store their tools there as well. Cause sea otters use their tools, which is incredible. And uh, shout out to another story. And I feel like this one's worth a live stream in its own digging in to find out. But a study looked at the use of tools of sea otters throughout history and using kind of archaeological evidence as well. Like, it just, like, yeah, I'm going to pop it in the description. Probably we're going to talk about it in the future because when I found it, I, I got so excited. Animals, history in one, like, you can't get better than that. Anyways, um, what else did I do? I should say their fur is the densest fur in the world. Uh, in terms of kind of just how thickly packed it is, per square inch on a sea otter, that little square inch area has more than a million hairs on it. It's that dense. And um, yeah, because they are in cold waters. And so they have quite a high metabolism. So they need that dense fur to help keep them warm and to help them kind of utilize the fur to their best advantage. They have to be really good at grooming. And so a lot of their day is spent grooming. Now, in terms of your question, oh, I should have shown more pictures of otters. Oh, no. Oh, is this a video? <gasps> Guys, it's a video. Look, at we get to see them in action. Oh, talk about a mood, man. That otter is hashtag mood right there, especially on what, like Wednesday, we're getting to the middle of the week. Like, yeah, man, I feel you. I feel you. I was hoping he was going to show us maybe his grooming technique, but you know, that's fine. He can just float around and look cool. I mean, oh, how can you not love them? And like their adaptations, like when they're on the surface, you know, they look really chill and adorable like that. But underwater, they are so fierce at swimming and diving and looking for food. Like their ability in the water is just mind boggling and something uh, to be envious of for sure. Uh, but your question, I'm sorry, I totally forgot that I, that was a video. Um, but I want you guys to tell me uh, in the chat, where do you think 90% of the world's sea otters live? Do you think they live in A, Alaska? B, Boston, or C, California. See what I did there? <laughs> yes. Anyways, in the chat, in the chat, Rita says you have Polito. <laughs> That's right, Rita. Oh my gosh. Actually, I should explain Lido for some of my friends who may not know. I, because I had no idea until I went to one. It was an open air swimming pool and it was really cool actually um and well literally cool because it was cold because it was outside and we're in england but it was it was a really nice experience and i highly recommend uh you going to alito if you have one near you um and just having a different type of swimming experience i feel like rita that's quite good preparation for getting you in the ocean because the cool air on top and that's why i like to kind of dive under the water quite quickly. I don't like to ease my way in um, because I think kind of being half in, half out makes it worse because the cold air on top, it's much warmer when you get used to it of being completely underwater. Um, but another way to do it is use an ice bucket. At some Lido's, they have an ice bucket that you can dump on yourself and then go into the pool. And then you're like, ah, this is warmer than the ice bucket that I just poured on myself. So yeah. I recommend ice bucket. But anyways, chat, where do we think? Where do we think? D Delaware. <laughs> EPD mouse. Uh, D Delaware. Interesting choice. I've never been to Delaware. I imagine it's quite a lovely state. But unfortunately, D Delaware was not an option, although I could put it on there. But that is not correct. Lucky L and Rita, you guys are correct. It is indeed a Alaska. So there's actually three different subspecies of sea otter and they're divided based on kind of geographical regions. So we have the southern sea otters, which are my uh, 
fellow amigos, the Californian sea otters. And then there's the Alaskan sea otters. And then there's this different group of um, sea otters that are kind of in the water between Russia and Japan. And so there's technically three different subspecies of otter. But yes, 90% of the world sea otters live in Alaska up there. And so as you can imagine, yeah, that's why they need the really dense fur because it is chilly water up there. All right, so we have one other, actually, I lie. We have two other animals that I quickly want to introduce you to before we talk about packing and some things that I highly recommend for a trip as well as things from the UK that might be coming with me. I wanted to introduce you to, well, chipmunks in general, I had to mention in terms of packing, because you know, chipmunk cheeks, that expression when your cheeks are full, um, or you play chubby cheeks by stuffing your cheeks full of marshmallows. But isn't the Hopi chipmunk adorable? Like, look at little, little. I love the coloration of these guys. So um, their name might allude to where you might find them. Uh, they are found in the southwestern kind of United States, like Colorado and Utah and Arizona. And yeah, they're just really good. This picture, I don't know why it's on flat ground, because these guys are really good at climbing. Um, there's another cool picture of him um, looking, looking snazzy, like I love that red coloration. But they're really good at climbing in rocky areas. So in fact, a study recently found that they prefer areas kind of the rockier, the better, like they really like broken rock and rubble, uh, specifically at the base of cliff faces or rock formations, which um, are plenty in the Southwest region. Um, and because of that, because they're really good at, you know, climbing and jumping from rock to rock kind of areas, in rocky areas like that, there's also going to be crevices and kind of deep fissures, which they'll then also use for den sites. Now, in terms of packing, before we get to our kind of quick question, chipmunk cheeks, as general for kind of chipmunk species, not just Hopi, but a few others, the chipmunk cheeks can actually stretch to be three times larger than the chipmunk's head. That's a lot. That's a lot of storage of food, but it actually comes in quite handy. And if you're a chipmunk, right, and you're you're gathering some grub and you don't have to hold it, you can run away from predators better. So having it in your cheeks, yes, it probably does something to your, your balance, you know, and that's probably why, you know, they have quite long tails to counterbalance that kind of weight distribution out. And so rather than carrying it and like being like, ah, oh, you're going to get me, but I have to hold on to my food. They can put it in their mouth and run away um, and have the food. So it's like a win-win situation. Now, some chipmunk species can carry kind of loads um, because of kind of their ability for their cheek stretching. Some chipmunk species can carry loads as large as themselves in their cheek pouches. Like talk about, whoa, <laughs> weight distribution status. Like, that is crazy. Oh, uh, Rita says, that's a feature you want. Really? Big cheeks that can store food? Like, I don't know. I feel like that would throw off kind of your groove if you're running, right? Like a half marathon or something? I don't know. I feel like you, you'd be thrown off. Which, by the way, I know, because sources told me, Rita actually ran their very first half marathon. So props to you, Rita. And I would say your next challenge, Rita, then, is to run another half marathon with your cheeks full of food, like a chipmunk. <laughs> crossing the finish line and then you can finish whatever is stored in your cheeks marshmallows uh peanut butter as we saw there's a love for peanut butter in the chat tonight uh but the quick question for you guys before we get on to the last species and i did save the best for last is do you guys think hopi chipmunks hibernate true or false so they are in the southwestern united states which is technically as you can see by the pictures here quite dry uh, but do you think they hibernate? I mean, what do you guys think? What do you think? Jazz trumpeters. <laughs> John. Oh, that is funny. Yes, they should be jazz trumpeters, right? They would be very good at using um, that instrument for sure. Oh, do you know, I played the violin when I was younger and I really, really, really wish I would have tried kind of instruments like the trumpet or the flute or something different 
um, because of my loud voice and apparently my big lung capacity, as some people say. Um, actually, I do have a pretty good lung capacity from surfing and being in the ocean. But I really would like to give it a try, John. And I think that's a good shout. And I think chipmunks probably would too. Like that that would be fantastic. So, so we're, we're working on a few uh, ideas there. Maybe that's what we need to see in a, in a Pokemon, a chipmunk Pokemon, one that can, you know, because we had Grookey, right, playing the drums, maybe a chipmunk that can play the trumpet. Uh, anyways, oh, you used to play the cello. Nice, Alec, look at between us. And I don't know, John, I'm assuming you, you played kind of the trumpet or something similar. Maybe, maybe we could all like pitch up and be an orchestra then with the amount of uh, different instruments played within us. As long as somebody plays the cowbell, that's all I need. I need someone has to play the cowbell. Maybe that'll be Maui, <laughs> Maui on cowbell. All right, anyways, Lucky L. Thank you, Lucky L, Alice and Rita. Yes, oh, saxophone, there we go. Nice, some bit of jazz, excellent. So yes, indeed, Hopi chipmunks do actually hibernate and there's a whole video about torpor and hibernation and introducing you to some really cool species that you may not have thought of that hibernate that actually do, which I'll pop at the end of this video, if I remember, at the end card title screen. And if not, I'll pop it in the description down below. Also, if I remember, if I'm not too busy running around trying to pack. So I saved the best for last and y'all, you're not gonna believe this. <laughs> it is an amphibian that loves to pack or at least carries things with them on travels. So my friends, this is the horned marsupial frog. They are an eternal, uh, nocturnal amphibian that is found throughout the canopies of Costa Rica, Panama, Ecuador, and Colombia. And uh, thanks to our friend Kitrid, or I say friend sarcastically, Kitrid, uh, they are classified as endangered by the IUCN Red List. Now, this species has been talked about quite a bit in the scientific community because uh, I believe it was in Ecuador, they were believed to be extinct, but then relatively recently, another um, individual was found in Ecuador. So everybody was like, woohoo, they're back in Ecuador, but they're still classified as endangered. So they're still at a threat. Now, the cool thing about these frogs, before we go into what they carry, is that the males call, apparently, and I haven't heard it myself, although I bet it would be pretty cool to hear, is similar to the sound of a pop of a champagne cork. And that happens during the mating season. So maybe they're celebrating, woohoo, it's mating season. And he makes that noise that sounds like the pop of a champagne um, cork going off. But it doesn't happen just once. Oh, no. His call happens about every eight to 12 minutes. That popping sound happens. I don't know. I feel I'd be pretty disappointed to be out in like the canopies of these incredible tropical jungles and hear like a champagne cork pop sound and then be like, oh, yeah. And then, oh yeah, go champagne. Maybe, maybe you should bring it if you're out there in the jungle. I'd probably bring it and cheers, cheers to the uh, frogs for mating season. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good shout. Anyways, I'm getting distracted. So you might think, all right, Shelby, this frog looks weird. Like obviously it has the horns on its eyes. It looks a bit funky, but it's back. What's going on with its back? Well, interesting for you to notice that. They breed by direct development. Now this particular process, get this, sees the females release eggs from their body for the male to then fertilize and then be deposited back into a pouch on the female's back. So this is a female, you can see her eggs and they've, I'm assuming, been fertilized. They're back on her back and she's literally carrying the fertilized <laughs> eggs on her back for about 60 to 80 days. And then they will hatch as fully developed frogs. Now, the reason why this looks pretty crazy to begin with on many different levels is that these guys actually have the largest egg of any known amphibian. So not only is it one big egg for an amphibian, but it's also <laughs> being carried on her back. We know that's and I mean, they are pretty striking looking frogs to begin with. You can see kind of the horned aspect of that um, kind of the skin that goes just above their eye. But look at the little baby frogs. Aren't they so cute? Uh, I really love 
I really love highlighting some amphibian species. And so, yeah, they are a very unique frog on many different levels. And the fact that they breed by this way just makes them stand out a bit more. And so I wanted to introduce you guys, because you know I love introducing you to weird animals that you probably never heard of. This is the horned marsupial frog. Um, but yeah, oh, sorry, Rita, sorry. But look, look, there's no bubbly skin in this picture. It's all cute frogs and that. I mean, look at their hands as well. Like, oh, what? yeah, just so cool. Anyways, so now that we talked about some amazing animals that travel really far and that carry things with them and the effort of preparing for traveling and whatnot, we're gonna quickly talk about five things that I would bring with me on a flight. Um, and I'm being completely honest with you guys here <laughs> in the fact that I, I'm telling you in the hopes that that will get me moving and actually packing. But then also five things that I would bring with me from the UK as gifts to other parts of the world. And I'd be keen to hear from the chat. You know, I know Lucky L, you're from England as well. I'd be keen to hear what you guys think of what five things you would bring as gifts if you were visiting another part of the world. But let's go to this. So I put up a little picture here of some of the stuff that I'm gonna pack for me to bring on the flight. Now, what I am going to pack are my tripods because I am planning on doing some filming when I'm out there. And over the next kind of two, three weeks, uh, I'm not going to be actively uploading it. Like it's not going to be in real time, the videos that you see. So they're all going to be from the past, not like too long ago, but like Cotswold Wildlife Park a video is coming out from that. And when I visited Beale Wildlife Park, there's been a couple of um <laughs> literal Shelby on Safari videos going to different collections. Uh, but this week, it's a little bit different. We're looking at red pandas from the movie Turning Red. And what I think as a wild animal biologist about the movie and how they depicted red pandas. So it's a bit of a hot take. Um, but yes, so that's this week. And then yeah, the following two weeks videos are going to be tours from going on adventures, only because I'm going to be hopefully back in California and, you know, seeing family and doing things like that. So I will still be filming videos, but um, yeah, so I'm bringing my tripods, but I feel like carry on luggage is super important for this flight um, and for any flight really, because it's about 11 hours, <laughs> which is a long time uh, to be sitting and I don't like sitting for long. So I'm gonna keep busy. So the neck pillow, interesting enough, is on there now. I'd be keen to hear from you guys in the chat. If you're on a long haul flight, do you like the neck pillows? I only use it and wear it because I feel like I have to wear it. Like I don't get anything like when I'm sleeping and if I can manage to fall asleep on a flight, like, I don't know, it just, just doesn't do anything for me, I don't think. I mean, there was one time where I did fall asleep and my head was like this and I did feel it. So maybe the neck pillow does do it. But I feel just morally obligated to bring it with me, bring it with me for a long haul flight. But I'm not really a fan. Uh, headphones for editing. Uh, you can see the computers on there as well. That's definitely something that I'm going to be bringing with me on my flight. Uh, but some of you may not know this, and I actually was speaking with one of my colleagues today about it, um, is for most flights, you can look up ahead of time what the in-flight entertainment options are going to be. And I have always done this, like since I can remember <laughs> since traveling, I always look at this ahead of time because that tells me what I need to bring on my carry on. So for example, for my current flight, I know, unfortunately, Spider-Man No Way Home is not going to be an in-flight entertainment option. In fact, the movie options for this flight are absolute rubbish. And so, unfortunately, that means I'm going to work and do editing because I, I like to enjoy movies and watch movies. But yeah, I don't know. I just I was really disappointed by the in-flight entertainment options. Not going to lie. Not going to throw my airline under the bus or anything. I'll give them a few days to up their ante. And then maybe when I join them on Friday, maybe they'll have uh, put in some good in-flight entertainment options. But alas, there we are. So yeah, computer notebook. I'm, I love a notebook. I love a list. Uh, I love writing stuff down. And in fact, probably on this flight, I'll be writing down things that I'll be wanting to film 
and do. So I have recently got a really cool notebook from Zeta Cell Whip Whipsnade Zoo, which actually, no, I don't have it in the room with me. But um, yeah, uh, behind the scenes kind of for the channel, I do write down a long list of ideas that I have and talking kind of from you guys as well. So like, um, you know, bringing up that sea otter history study again, probably going to go in my notebook to refer to for future use. But yeah, I, I just like writing notes and different things to do. I don't know. I'm just a note taker. But yeah, that's definitely something I need to bring. But probably the most important aspect of bringing on luggage um, and what I'll have, apart from kind of cell phone chargers, because I'm going to need my phone for showing my COVID vaccination things, uh, but is gum. I, I don't know why, but ever since I was younger, I always remember when traveling with my dad on flights, he'd always be like, here, have a piece of gum to like, help pop my ears while going up. And so it's just something that has stayed with me. So I always have a pack of gum. Now, that's the hot take question, guys, is what flavor of gum do I have? I prefer kind of a winter fresh um, taste. I'm not really like peppermint is fine. Like if that's all they have, like I'll have it. But I'm not really a big fan of peppermint. But yeah, the it's kind of like actually the color of that gum thing. I'm all for that kind of Arctic fresh. I don't know what the name of it is, but that's the gum I choose. Uh, but yes, what snacks will I take with me on my flight? Actually, I it depends where I'm at. I think I'm flying out of Terminal 5, which I think has an Itsu, which is nice. Uh, but I hope there's a Pret. Now, Pret is a great shade for those who are watching that don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I really like Pret. It's probably one of my favorite chains. And <laughs> Alice is, knows what I'm going to say next. Double berry muffin. That's my that's my Achilles heel. I love a double berry muffin. One of my friends uh, got one for me once, and that was the fatal mistake that he made. Um, <laughs> it was because I, I I always love an almond croissant. That's my way to go. But a double berry muffin, it just is nice because it has a good bit of crumble on top, which is really good. Like I really fancy that in a muffin is those little crumb crumbly bits on top. Like that's how I judge my muffin. And the double berry muffin doesn't let me down. But that's definitely a snack that I would bring. Um, I don't mind airplane food, actually, on flights. I've been touch wood, very good about airplane food. I think I'm going to be too excited to eat, if I'm honest. Um, so I'll just kind of eat what they have. Uh, but I stay super hydrated. Actually, I should say that's one thing that I uh, always highly recommend for those of you who may not travel long distances frequently or you haven't yet. When you do a long haul flight, I know it's scary at sometimes going to the bathroom at high altitude, but drink plenty, plenty of water. And that also is a nice excuse to keep moving as well as to get up and do laps every so often when you go to the loo. Anyways, the thing you guys all wanted to see uh, <laughs> is what top five things I'm going to bring with me to bestow upon my family and friends uh, from the United Kingdom. So, oh, not cinnamon. I should have known that, Katie. I should have known that. Uh, so first and foremost, I didn't want to put this one on here. And I hope either of them aren't watching at this point. But uh, the top left-hand corner is Marmite. Now, Marmite is an interesting phrase uh, that is used here in the UK. It, you kinda, it's like Marmite. And that means it quite divides people. Either you love it or you hate it. Now, I'm one of those people where I'm more on the side of hate, but I appreciate it as an addition to, say, gravy or spaghetti bolognese sauce in small portions, not like a big dollop. I'm not emptying the whole jar in, but it does really add an extra oomph of flavor. Uh, but I would never, ever, ever put it on toast like this. Now, I know some people in this chat would, and to be fair, that you do you, as the expression goes, but... Yes, I, I am bringing Marmite because my husband says, you need to bring it out and have them try it. But I have a plan for how I'm going to get them to try Marmite. But I'm not going to share it with you guys now, just in case they're watching. Uh, below Marmite is recently what I've realized a lot of people don't know what crumpets actually are. So there's that expression, you know, oh, have tea and crumpets. Oh, you're so British. But I never knew what crumpets were until coming over here. Like I knew that they were like a snack, but I didn't know that they are far, far, far superior than an English muffin. Like I know Alice, you're probably gonna ask me to bring you back an English muffin. And I'm gonna say no, because they're not worthy, not worthy at all compared to crumpets. They are more sourdough in nature, 
um, English muffins, but their crumpets are far superior. And I think it's the diversity of what you can put on a crumpet, which is delicious. And the variety of different crumpets, you know, the floofiness comparatively. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping to bring crumpets back for them and their lives are going to be forever changed. Now, the middle one, for those of you who may not know, are hot cross buns. Now, this is a hot take because I do not like raisins and sultanas, and many hot cross buns have raisins, sultanas in them, and they're evil. Um, but recently, someone spoiled me with some yummy hot cross buns, which do not have raisins and sultanas in them, uh, and they are delicious. So I might consider grabbing some hot cross buns because it's Easter time um, and giving them to people there. Now, top right hand corner is Percy Pigs. These are a delicious treat from Marks and Spencers or Marks and Sparks, where they are kind of fruity, gummy, and they're just wholesome treats. Like if that, it, actually, Alice, you asked about a snack that I would bring with me on the flight. I would bring Percy Pigs because they're a sweet where it kicks the sweet tooth bit, but it doesn't overpower you with sweetness. Like you don't feel sick after eating Percy pigs, um, where sometimes with some candy or sweets you do. But yeah, I just really like Percy pigs and they have a different assortment based on some of his friends. So they have a globe trotting one, which had like a tiger and a panda on it, which I was like, oh, that's so cute. Um, even though, <laughs> yeah, it was just interesting. I, I do love a Percy pig. But the last thing that I definitely am going to bring is lemon curd. Now lemon curd is going to go nicely on toast. It will go good on scones. It's just, uh, oh, I didn't put scones on here. I probably bring scones as well, even though I think you can make them in the States and I'm sure you can get them in the States, but I, I'm always iffy about bringing stuff because the last time I went, I actually did bring crumpets and they bursted in my suitcase and they got moldy because of the air ripping it open. Yeah, I'm explaining it terribly, but yeah, um, I don't know if it'd be worth it. Cause that's the worst thing is when you bring something and then on the flight over, it gets destroyed or whatever, or the people at customs take it. And then you're like, no, but I got it for them. And they don't even get to try it. It's sad. Uh, but yes, anyways, other than that, that is it. What? Oh, Oh, hi, Grace. No, you're fine. Put you in your suitcase, too. I'd have to have a layover in Florida. No, no. I, I'd like direct flights, please. Direct from London. Thank you. Um, but yeah, Grace, I don't know if you'll know many of these things that are on here. I think, Grace, I think you would like Percy Pigs. They're really good. Um, but yeah, so many exciting things to try um, to bring out to family and friends uh, from the UK. There's a lot of interesting things that I don't think would travel well. So sometimes it makes you think like, oh, you just gotta come over here, Grace, and try it for yourself. But it will be interesting to see what treats I bring back from the States. Uh, indeed, that might be a little blurb vlog video in of itself. Now I encourage you guys, if you don't already, be sure to follow me over on Instagram at Shelby on Safari. And as I mentioned, somebody who's in this chat currently got me to start a TikTok, which I will be attempting. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, I'm quite active over on Instagram and there I'll be sharing kind of stories of what I'm getting up to before you guys see the full video kind of vlog experience in a few weeks. After brainstorming it, I think it's going to be about a four week series where for four weeks, every Friday, you're going to see um, some aspect of the journey. I know we've talked about some of the things before, but I'm really looking forward to hopefully sharing with you guys uh, a bit of kind of where I grew up, some of the sights, sounds and places that mean a lot to me and bringing you guys on a different kind of safari. But in the lead up to that, like I said, this Friday, we'll be looking at turning red and my hot take as a wild animal biologist who works with red pandas on did Disney and Pixar get red pandas right uh, before showing you guys Cotswold Wildlife Park and Beale Wildlife Park in gardens as well. So with that, Thank you guys so much for <laughs> joining me tonight. I've just had a quick look at the chat. You guys are hilarious. Uh, but thank you guys so much for joining me as we traveled around the world, seeing some incredible animals that do some incredible travel distances like the Arctic Tern and the Northern Elephant Seal, as well as to animals like the horned marsupial frog that carry some interesting things around with them. Oh, 
Woo, there we are. It's time for my cup of tea, friends. I'm gonna go actually start packing. Uh, thanks so much for joining me and I will see you guys in next week's video. Or if you're watching the replay, I will have it actually remembered to put in the video right here about torpor and hibernation and some cool animals that you might not know hibernate but do. But if you're watching this live, you're probably laughing because I look like a fool pointing to something that doesn't exist. Welcome to my world. All right, guys, have a good evening. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. And I will see you in whichever video you decide to click on next. Thanks so much. Bye.